Martin had prided himself on being a good judge of books. He didn't know much about himself. He had not judged as little to me without thought, as I know some of those old men. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a purple faced old man. No, not yet, Dad. Then you don't know about thought, do you? Will you be taking coffee now, Mum? Probably in half an hour, Edna. I'll ring from the drawing room. Yes, sir. Well, well, this is very nice. Very nice. Uh, good dinner, too, Sybil. You can tell cook from me. Oh, absolutely first class. Arthur, you're not supposed to say such things, not in front of a guest. Oh, I'm treating Gerald as one of the family now. I'm sure he won't object. Go on, Gerald. Just you object. No, I wouldn't dream of it. In fact, I insist upon being treated as one of the family now. After all, I've been trying long enough, haven't I? Well, haven't I? Hmm, yes. Except that time last summer when you hardly came near me. And I wondered what had happened to you. And I told you I was awfully busy at the works all that time. Yes, that's what you say. But now, Sheila, don't tease him. When you're married, you'll come to realize that men with important work do sometimes have to spend a great deal of their time and energy on their business. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> What's the joke? I don't know. Suddenly felt I just had to laugh. You're squiffy. I'm not. What an expression, Sheila. Really, the things you girls pick up these days. If you think that's the best she can do. Well, don't be an ass, Eric. Now stop it, you two. Arthur? Oh, oh yes, of course, dear. <clears throat> Gerald, on the occasion of this quiet little family party, I'd like to say to you, quite frankly, without any pretenses, that your engagement to Sheila means a tremendous lot to me. She'll make you happy, and I'm sure you'll make her happy too. You're just the sort of son-in-law I've always wanted. Your father, Sir George, and I have been friendly rivals in business for uh, many years, but now that you've brought us together, perhaps we may look forward to the day when Crofts and Burlings may stop competing and work together for lower costs and higher prices. Yeah, yeah. Arthur, I don't think you ought to talk about business on an occasion like this. Oh, oh I, I just mentioned it in passing, my dear. <laughs> no, what I really wanted to say was, here's wishing the pair of you the best that life can give. Gerald and Sheila. Yes, Gerald. Yes, Sheila, darling. Our congratulations and very best wishes. Thank you. Eric? All the best. She's got a nasty temper sometimes, but she's not bad, really. Chump. I can't drink to this, can I? When do I drink? You can drink to me. All right then, Gerald. I drink to you. Thank you. And I drink to you. And I hope I can make you as happy as you deserve to be. You be careful, or I'll start weeping. Or perhaps this. I will help you not to. Oh, Gerald, have you got it? Is it the one you wanted me to have? The very one. Oh, it's wonderful. It's perfect. Now I feel really engaged. Oh, and it came just at the right moment, too. Oh, that was clever of you, Gerald. Oh. Well, Arthur. If you've no more to say, I think Sheila and I had better go into the drawing room. Oh, of course, my dear. Now, don't keep Gerald too long. Eric, I want you a minute. Cigar? Oh, no, thank you. I can't really enjoy them. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. I like a good cigar. Oh, help yourself. No, oh, thank you. I um, wanted to mention to you, in uh, strict confidence, of course, uh, now that we're by ourselves, I um, have an idea that your mother... Lady Croft, oh, thanks. Uh, although she does not object to it, my girl, feels that you might have done better for yourself socially. 
Oh, I, I really don't think so, sir. Oh, well, that, that's all right. Uh, I don't blame her. She comes from an old county family. It's quite natural. But what I wanted to say is that there's a fair chance my name might find its way onto the next honours list. Uh, just a knighthood, of course. Oh, I say. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Yeah. Well, I was Lord Mayor two years ago when royalty visited us, and I've always been considered a good party man, so I think there's a good chance of a knighthood. Well, as long as we don't cause any trouble, get into the police court, start a scandal, eh? You seem a nice, well-behaved sort of family to me. Well, it's just a matter of keeping out of trouble for a few months. <laughs> What's the joke? Or oh, nothing. Uh, do you want another glass of port? Yes, please. Mother says we mustn't stay too long. But I don't think it matters. I left them talking about clothes again. You'd think a girl never had any clothes before she got married. Women are potty about them. Ah, but what you don't understand, my boy, is that clothes mean something quite different to a woman. They're a sort of sign or token of the self-respect. Oh, that's true. Yes. I remember this. What? Nothing. Nothing? Sounds a bit fishy to me. <laughs> well, we don't know what these young boys get up to these days. More money to spend and time to spare than I had when I was Eric's age. <laughs> yeah, they worked us hard and kept us pretty short of cash. Mind you, we did manage to break out and have a bit of fun sometimes. I'm sure you did. <laughs> well, there's no harm in that, as long as you're keeping it in its right place. Oh, oh quite. But these days, when well, things are so much easier, what I want to say is, now, I don't want to lecture you young fellas. Is that a man has to make his own way. Look after himself and his family. And as long as he does that, he won't come to much harm. Of course, the way some of these cranks are talking and writing now, you'd think that everybody had to look after everybody else. Community and all that nonsense. Take it from me. A man has to mind his business. Look after himself. And his own... F Somebody at the front door. Hmm. Well, I don't answer it. Ah, come on, Gerald. We'll have another glass of this, and uh, then we'll join the ladies. Uh, if you'll just wait here, sir, I'll go and tell Mr. Burling. An inspector? What kind of inspector? A police inspector. He says his name's Inspector Gould. Oh, I don't know him. Does he want to see me? Yes, sir. He says it's important. All right, then. He'd better show him in here. Yes, sir. I'm still on the benches. Probably something about a warrant. Yeah, sure to be. Unless, of course, Eric's been up to something. That would be awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> Very. <laughs> Inspector Gould. Mr. Burling? Yes. Now well, sit down, Inspector. Thank you, sir. Have a glass of port or a little whiskey? Oh, no, thank you, Mr. Burling. I'm on duty. You're new here, aren't you? Yes, sir. Only recently transferred. Oh, I thought so. I've been an alderman for years, Lord Mayor two years ago, and I'm still on the bench. So I know the uh, Bromley police officers pretty well. I thought I hadn't seen you before. Quite so. Oh, now then, Inspector, what can I do for you? Some trouble about a warrant? No, Mr. Burling. Well, what then? I'd like some information, if you don't mind, Mr. Burling. Two hours ago, a young woman died in the infirmary. She was taken there this afternoon, after swallowing quite a lot of strong disinfectant. Burnt her inside out, of course. My God. Yes, yes, she was in great agony. They did what they could for her at the infirmary, but she died. Suicide, of course. Yes, yes, horrible business. But I don't see why you should come here to see me, Inspector. Well, I went round to the room that she had, and she'd left a letter and a sort of diary. I like a lot of these young women who get themselves into all sorts of trouble. She'd use more than one name. But her original name, her real name, was Eva Smith. Eva Smith? Do you remember her at all, Mr. Burning? Well, I seem to have heard that name somewhere, but... Ah, it doesn't convey anything to me. She was employed in your works at one time. I found a photograph of her in her, her, in her lodgings. Perhaps you'd remember it from there. Hmm. 
I think you remember Eva Smith now, don't you, Mr. Burley? Yes, I do. She was an employee at my works, and then I discharged her. Was that why she committed suicide? When was this, Father? Oh, just keep quiet, Eric. Oh, well, she left nearly two years ago. That was the early autumn of 1910. Yes. Uh, late September, 1910. Oh, that's it. Uh, look here, sir, wouldn't you rather I was out of oh, this? Oh, no, I don't mind you being here at all, Gerald. There's nothing mysterious or scandalous about this business, as far as I'm concerned. No, it's quite a straightforward case. And I don't think the fact that she was discharged from my works uh, has anything to do with the wretched girl's suicide, eh, Inspector? Uh, no, sir, I can't agree with you there. Why not? Well, because what happened to her then may have determined what happened to her afterwards. Uh, chain of events. I can't accept any responsibility for that. Now, if we were responsible for everything that happened to everybody that we ever met, it would be a bit awkward, wouldn't it? Very awkward. Uh, it put us in a very difficult position, wouldn't it? Yeah, but about this girl, Eva Smith, I remember her quite well now. She's a lively, good-looking girl, country bred, I fancy, and she was employed in one of my machine shops. Anyway, that August, when they got back from their holidays, they were all a bit unsettled, and they decided to ask for more money. Now, I was paying them 22 and sixpence a week, which is neither more nor less than what is generally paid in our industry. Anyway, they wanted a, a rise in the rate so that they would average about 25 shillings a week. Well, I refused, of course. Why? Did you say why? Yes. Why did you refuse? Well, I don't see that it's any concern of yours how I choose to run my business, Inspector, is it now? It's my duty to ask questions. Well, it's my duty to keep labor costs down. And if I'd agreed to this demand for a new rate, it would have put 12% on labor costs. Does that satisfy you? So I refused, of course. I said I, I couldn't consider it. They could work at the usual rate, but if they didn't want to, then they could go and work somewhere else. Well, it's a free country, isn't it? It isn't. If you can't go and work somewhere else... Quite so. Keep out of this, Eric. You hadn't even started at the works when this happened. Anyway, they went on strike. <laughs> that didn't last long, of course. It was after the holidays. They'd be all broke, if I know them. Right. Gerald broke. That's what they were. And so was the strike after a couple of weeks or so. <laughs> Pitiful affair. Oh, well, I let them all come back at the usual rate. Except for four or five of the ringleaders who'd started all the trouble. I went down and told them myself, told them to clear out. And Eva Smith was one of them. She'd had a lot to say, far too much, so she had to go. Well, you couldn't have done anything else. No. He could. He could have kept her on. Rubbish! If you don't come down sharply on some of these people, they'll ask for the earth. I should say, sir. Yeah, well, they might. But it's better to ask for the earth than to take it. What did you say your name was, Inspector? Ghoul. G-O-O-L-E. Oh. And how do you get on with our Chief Constable, Colonel Roberts? I don't see much of him. Well, I think I ought to warn you that he's a very good friend of mine. I uh, see him fairly frequently. We play golf sometimes up at the West Bromley. I don't play golf. I didn't suppose you did. Anyway, there it is. I've told you everything I know. I told her to clear out, and she did. I never heard of her again. Do you know what happened to her after? Uh, did she get into trouble? Go on the streets? No, no, not exactly go on the streets. What's all this about the streets? Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Mummy sent me in to ask you why you didn't come along to the drawing room. Ah, uh, we'll be along in a minute, Sheila, just finishing. No, I'm afraid not. There's nothing else I've told you that. Now, what's this all about? Uh, it's nothing to do with you, Sheila. Run along. Now, wait a minute, Miss Burney. Now, look here, Inspector. I consider that uncalled for and officious. I've told you everything that I know, and I don't think it's all that important, and I see not the slightest reason why you should drag my girl into this unpleasant business. What business? What's happening? I'm a police inspector, Miss Burley. This afternoon, a young woman drank some disinfectant and died after several hours of agony tonight in the infirmary. How horrible. Was it an accident? No, no, she wanted to kill herself. 
She felt she couldn't go on any longer. Well, don't tell me that's because I discharged her from my employment nearly two years ago. You might have started it. Did you, Dad? Yes, I did. She was causing trouble at the works. I was quite justified. Well, you were quite right. I know we'd have done the same thing. Don't look at me like that, Sheila. Sorry. It's just that I can't help thinking about this girl destroying herself so horribly. What was she like? Quite young? Oh, yes. Yes, 24. Pretty? Well, she wasn't pretty when I saw her today, but she had been pretty, very pretty. That's enough of that. And I don't really see that this inquiry is getting you anywhere, Inspector. It's what happened to her after she left Mr. Burling's works that's important. Well, obviously, I suggested that some time ago. Well, we can't help you there because we don't know. Are you sure you don't know? Wait a minute, Inspector. Are you suggesting that one of them knows something about this girl? Yes. So you didn't just come here to see me? No. Well, that's different, isn't it? Are you sure of your facts? Some of them, yes. I can't think that they're of any great consequence. The girl's dead, though. What do you mean by saying that? You talk as if we were responsible. Oh, be quiet, Sheila. Uh, Inspector, I think it would be sensible if you and I went over and discussed this quietly in a court. Why should you? He's finished with you. He says it's one of us now. But I'm trying to settle it for you sensibly. Well, there's nothing to settle as far as I'm concerned. I've never known an Eva Smith. Neither have I. Was that her name? Eva Smith? Yes. Yeah. Never heard it before. So, where are you now, Inspector? Where I was before, Mr. Croft, I told you that, like a lot of these young women, she used more than one name. Hmm. Well, do you know what happened to her after she left my works? Yes. She was out of work for two months. Both her parents were dead, so she had no home to go back to. And she hadn't been able to save much out of what Burling and company had paid her. So, after two months, with no work, no money coming in, Living in lodgings, no relatives, few friends, lonely, half-starved. She was feeling desperate. I should think so. It's a rotten shame. Oh, there are a lot of young women living that sort of existence in every city and big town in this country, Miss Burley. If there weren't, the factories and warehouses wouldn't know where to look for cheap labor. Ask your father. But these girls aren't cheap labor. They're people. I've had that notion myself from time to time. At all events, she then had what she considered to be a wonderful stroke of luck. She was taken on in a shop, and a good shop too. Millwoods. Millwoods? We go there. She was lucky to get taken on there. Yeah, that's what she thought. It was a nice change from a factory. Uh, she liked being among pretty clothes, I've no doubt. And she, uh, she felt she was making a new start. Yes, of course. And then she got into trouble there, I suppose. Well, it seems that a customer complained about her. So she had to go. I thought as much. When was this? End of January last year. What did this girl look like? If you'll come over here, I'll show you. What's the matter with her? You recognized her from the photograph, didn't she? Yes. What the devil do you mean by coming here upsetting my girl like that? No, I didn't do it. She's upsetting herself. Why? Why? Now, that I don't know. That's what I'm here to find out. I think I'll find out myself first. Shall I go to her, sir? No, leave this to me. I'm going to talk to my wife. Tell her what's happening. I'd like to see that photograph now, Inspector. All in good time. Well, I don't see why I Let's shouldn't see them. Let's have one line of inquiry at a time, Mr. Croft. Otherwise, we'll all be talking at once and wonder where we are. If you've anything to tell me, you'll have an opportunity of doing it soon. Oh. I suppose I have. Look here, I've had just about enough of this. I dare say. 
Well, I'm sorry, but you see, we were having a party here, and I've had a few drinks, including rather a lot of champagne. And I've got a headache, and as I'm only in the way here, I think it would be better if I turned in. And I think you'd better stay here. Why should I? Well, it might be less trouble. If you turned in now, you might have to turn out again soon. Well, Miss Burling? You knew it was me all the time, didn't you? I had an idea it might be. Well, I felt rotten about it at the time. And now I feel a lot worse. Did it make much difference to her? Yes, I'm afraid it did. The last real steady job she had, you see. So I'm really to blame? No, not entirely. A great deal happened to her after that. But you're partly to blame, just like your father. What did Sheila do? I went to the manager at Millwood's, and I told him that if they didn't get rid of that girl, I'd never go near the place again. And I'd persuade Mother to close our account with them. Now, why did you do that? Because I was in a furious temper. Was it the girl's fault? No, not really. It was my fault. All right, Gerald, you needn't look at me like that. At least I'm trying to tell the truth. I expect you've done things you're ashamed of, too. You never said I hadn't. But I don't see why you had All to get All right, this... you can settle that between you later. What happened? I'd gone in there to try something on. It was an idea of my own. Mother had been against it and so had the assistant, but I insisted. As soon as I tried it on, I knew that they were right. It just, just didn't suit me at all. I looked silly in the thing. Well, this girl had brought the dress up from the workroom. And when the assistant, Miss Francis, had asked her something about it, this girl to show us what she meant, had held the dress up as if she was wearing it. And it just suited her. She was the right type for it, just as I was the wrong type. When I tried the thing on and, and looked at myself in the mirror and knew that it was all wrong, I caught sight of this girl, smiling, as if to say, doesn't she look awful? And I was a absolutely furious. And then I went to the manager, and I told him that this girl had been very impertinent. Well, how could I know what would happen afterwards? If she'd been some miserable, plain little creature, I don't suppose I'd have done it, but she was very pretty. She looked as if she could take care of herself. I, I couldn't be sorry for her. In fact, in a kind of way, you might be said to have been jealous of her. Yes, I suppose so. And so you used the power you had as the daughter of a good customer and a man well known in the town to punish the girl just because she made you feel like that? Yes. But it didn't seem to be anything very terrible at the time, don't you understand? And if I could help her now, I would. But you can't. It's too late. She's dead. My God. It's a bit thick when you come to think of it. Oh, shut up, Eric. I know, I know. It's... It's the only time I've ever done anything like that. Why did it happen? That's what I asked myself when I was looking at that dead girl tonight. And then I said, all right, we'll try to understand why it had to happen. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm not going until I find out all that happened. Eva Smith lost a job with Burling and Company because the strike failed and they were determined not to have another one. At last, she found another job. Under what name, I don't know. In a big shop and had to leave there because you were annoyed with yourself and passed the annoyance on to her. Well, now she had to think of something else. So she changed her name to Daisy Renton. What did you say? I said she changed her name to Daisy Renton. Do you mind if I help myself to another drink, Sheila? <clears throat> Where's your father, Miss Burling? 
He's with my mother in the drawing room. I'd like to speak to him. Eric, take the inspector along to the drawing room. Well, Gerald? Lossier? How did you come to know this girl? Eva Smith? I didn't know her. Daisy Renton, then. It's the same thing. Well, what gives you the idea that I knew Don't her? Don't be stupid. We haven't much time. You gave yourself away as soon as he mentioned her other name. All right, then. I knew her. Let's leave it at that, hmm? We can't leave it at that. Listen, darling. You not only knew her, but you knew her very well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be looking so guilty about it. When did you first get to know her? Was it after she left Millwoods when she changed her name? Were you seeing her last spring and summer when you hardly came near me and said you were so busy? Were you? Yes, of course you were. I'm sorry, darling. It was all over ages ago. I haven't seen the girl since last summer. I don't come into this suicide business. I thought I didn't half an hour ago. You don't. Neither do I. So, oh, for God's sake, don't say anything to the inspector. About you and this girl? Yeah. We can keep it from him. Why, you fool, he knows. Of course he knows. And I hate to think how much he knows that we don't know yet. You'll see. Well, Mr. Croft? You see? What did I tell you? Well, what did you tell him? Inspector, I, I think Miss Burling should be excused any more of this questioning. She's nothing more to tell you. She's had a long, exciting and tiring day. We, we were celebrating our engagement, you know. And, well, I think she's had about as much as she can stand. Have you? Probably. Well, I don't want to keep you here. I have no more questions for you. No, but you haven't finished asking questions, have you? No. Then I'm staying. Sheila, it's bound to be unpleasant. And you think young women ought to be protected from unpleasantness? If possible, yes. And we know one young woman who wasn't, don't we? Well, I suppose I asked for that. Be careful you don't ask for any more, Gerald. All I meant to say to you was, why stay when you'll hate it? Well, it can't be any worse for me than it has been, and it might be better. I see. What do you see? Well, you've been through it, so you want to see somebody else put through it. So that's what you think I'm really like. Well, I'm glad I realized it in time, Gerald. No, no, I didn't mean yes, that you, you did. Yes, you did. And if you really loved me, you couldn't have said that. But because I got that girl sacked from Millwoods, you've made up your mind I'm a selfish, vindictive creature. I've neither said that nor even suggested then it. Then why say that I want to see somebody else put through it? That's not what I meant at all. All right, then, I'm sorry. Yes, but you don't believe me. Allow me, Miss Burling. I can tell you why Miss Burling wants to stay and why she says it would be better for it if she did. Our girl died tonight. A pretty, lively sort of girl who never did anybody any harm. But she died in misery and agony, hating life. Don't, please. Now, Miss Burling's been made to understand what she did to this girl. She feels responsible. Now, if she leaves us now and doesn't hear any more, she'll feel she's entirely to blame. And I can't. I won't believe that it's all my fault. There, you see. We have to share something. If there's nothing else, we have to share our guilt. Oh, yes, that's true. You know, I don't understand about you. There's no reason why you should. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, madam. My husband's just explained why you're here and why we'll be glad to tell you anything you want to know. I don't think we can help you much. Mother, please. Whatever's the matter, Sheila. You're beginning all wrong. And I'm afraid that you'll say something or do something that you'll be sorry for afterwards. I don't know what you're talking about, Sheila. We all began like that. So confident, so pleased with ourselves. Until he began asking his questions. Well. You seem to have made a great impression on my daughter, Inspector. We usually do on the young ones. They're more impressionable. You're looking tired, dear. I think you ought to go to bed and forget all about this absurd business. You'll feel better in the morning. Mother, don't, for your own sake as well as ours. You mustn't. You mustn't what? Oh, really, Sheila? You mustn't try to build up a kind of wall between us and that girl. 
If you do, then the inspector will just break it down and it'll be all the worse when he does. I don't understand you. Do you? Yes, and she's right. I beg your pardon? I said yes, I do understand her, and she's right. That, I consider, is a trifle impertinent, Inspector. Oh, I realize you may have to conduct some sort of inquiry here, but so far, I must say, you seem to be conducting it in a rather peculiar and offensive manner. You know, of course, my husband was Lord Mayor only two years ago, and that he is still a magistrate. Where is your husband, Mrs. Burley? He'll be back in a moment. He's just talking to my son, Eric, who seems to be in an excitable and silly mood. What's the matter with him? Eric? Oh. Well, I'm afraid he may have had rather too much to drink tonight. We were having a little celebration here. Isn't he used to drinking? No, of course not. He's only a boy. No, he's a young man. And some young men drink far too much. And Eric's one of them. She! I don't want to get poor Eric into trouble, but we really must stop these silly pretenses. This isn't the time to pretend that Eric isn't used to drink. He's been steadily drinking too much for the last two years. It isn't true. Well, you know him, Gerald. Well, you must know it isn't true. Well, Mr. Croft? I'm afraid it is, you know. Actually, I haven't seen much of him outside of this house, but I have gathered that he does drink pretty hard. Time you choose to tell me. Yes, of course it is, and that's what I meant about building up a wall that's sure to be knocked flat. But it's you, and not the inspector here, who is doing it. Yes, but don't you see, he hasn't started on you yet. Well, if necessary, I shall be glad to answer any questions the inspector wishes to ask me. Though naturally, I don't know anything about this girl. We'll see, Mrs. Burling. I've been trying to persuade Eric to go to bed, but he won't. He says you told him to stay up. Did you? Yes, I did. Why? Because I want to speak to him, Mr. Burley. Well, I don't see why you should, but if you must, I suggest you get on with it now. I'm sorry, he'll have to wait. Now, look here, Inspector. He'll have to wait his turn. You see? No, I don't. Oh, come along. What is it you want to know? The end of January last year, Eva Smith had to leave Millwoods because Miss Burling compelled them to discharge her. And then uh, she stopped being Eva Smith, looking for a job, and became Daisy Renton, with other ideas. Mr. Croft, when did you first get to know her? What gives you the idea that I did know her? It's no use, Gerald. You're wasting time. Well, as soon as I mentioned the name Daisy Renton, it was obvious you knew her. Anyway, I knew already. When and where did you first meet her? Oh, all right, if you must have it. I met her in March last year in the Stalls Bar at the Palace. I mean, the Palace Music Hall here in Brumley. Well, we didn't think you meant Buckingham Palace. Oh, thanks. You're going to be a great help, I can see. Oh, all right, Mr. Croft. The Stalls Bar at the Palace Variety Theatre. Well, I happened to drop in there one night after rather a dull, tiring day. As the show wasn't very bright, I went down to the bar for a drink. It's a favourite haunt for women of the town. But I didn't propose to stay there long. I can't bear those hard-eyed, doe-faced women. But then I noticed this girl who was completely different. She was very pretty. Soft brown hair and big dark eyes. What's the matter? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I... suddenly reared. Taken it in properly. She's dead. Yes. She's dead. Go on. Oh, she was young and... fresh, charming completely out of place down there. But obviously she wasn't enjoying herself. Old Joe Megatty, half drunk and goggle-eyed, wedged her into a corner with that obscene fat carcass. Surely of you don't mean Alderman Megatty? But of course I do. He's a notorious womanizer as well as being one of the worst sots and rogues in Brumley. Oh, that's quite right. Well, really, Alderman Megatty. I must say we are learning something tonight. Go on, please. Well, the girl saw me looking at her and 
gave me a glance that could only have been a cry for help. So, I went across to Megaty and made up some nonsense about the manager having a message for him or something like that and got him out of the way. And then I told the girl that if she didn't want anything more like that sort of thing, she must let me take her out of there. Well, she agreed at once. Where did you go? We went along to the county hotel, which I knew would be quiet at that time of night. We had a drink or two and talked. She talked about herself? Yeah. She told me her name was Daisy Renton, that she'd lost both her parents, and that she came from somewhere outside Bromley. I couldn't get any exact details out of her about her past life, but what she did let slip, although she didn't mean to, that she was penniless. And at that moment, actually hungry. Oh, I made the people at the county find some food for her. And then you decided to keep her as your mistress? What? Of course, Mother. It was obvious from the start. Go on, Gerald. Don't my mother. Go oh, I discovered... Not that night, but two nights later when we met again. No, not by accident that time, of course. It, she was desperately hard up and about to be evicted from the miserable back room she had. Though it happened that a friend of mine had let me have a key to a nice set of rooms he had in Morgan Terrace and asked me to keep an eye on them and use them if I wanted. So I insisted on Daisy moving into those rooms and I made her take some money to keep her going. I want you to understand that I didn't install her there to make love to her. I'm sorry for her and I, I couldn't stand the idea of her going back to the palace bar. I asked for nothing in return. Nevertheless, she became your mistress. Yes. Well, it was inevitable, I suppose. She was young, pretty, warm-hearted, and intensely grateful. I immediately became the most important thing in her life. Do you understand? Oh, yes, yes. She was a woman. She was lonely. Were you in love with her? Just what I was going to ask. I really must protest. Now, why should you do any protesting? It was you who turned the girl out in the first place. Were you in love with her, Gerald? It's hard to say. I didn't feel about her as she felt about me. Of course not. You were the wonderful fairy prince. You must have adored it, Gerald. I don't think we need to hear further details of this disgusting affair. I do. And anyhow, we haven't had any details yet. And you're not going to have any. It wasn't disgusting, you know. It is disgusting to me. When did this affair end? Early in September last year. I had to go away on business then for a few weeks. By that time, Daisy knew it was coming to an end. So I broke it off definitely before I went. How did she take it? Much better than I'd hoped. She was very gallant about it. That was nice for you? No, it wasn't. She told me that she'd been happier than she'd ever been before, but that she knew that it couldn't last. She hadn't expected it to last. She didn't blame me at all. Wish to God she had now and might feel better about it. She had to move out of those rooms? Yes. We'd agreed about that. Well, she'd managed to save some money during the summer. She'd lived very economically on what I'd allowed her and she wouldn't take any more from me. But I insisted on her taking as a parting gift enough money. Although it wasn't so very much to keep her going to the end of the year. Did she tell you what she proposed to do after you left her? No. She wouldn't talk about that. But I gathered from one or two things that she said that she'd thought of leaving Brumley, but whether she did or not, I don't know. Did she? Yes, yes. She went away for about two months to some seaside place. By herself? Yes. I think she went away to... Uh be alone, to be quiet, and remember all that had happened between you. How do you know that? Well, she kept a rough sort of diary, and uh, in there she said that she wanted to be alone, to be quiet, to remember, just to make it last longer. She felt that nothing 
could be so good for her again. So she had to make it last longer. I see. Well, I never saw her again. That's all I can tell you. It's all I want to know from you. Well, in that case, as I'm rather more upset by this business than I probably appear, I'd like to be alone for a while. I would be very grateful if you'd let me go. Go where? Home? No, I'd just go outside and walk for a while. I'll, I'll come back. All right, Mr. Cobb. Just in case you forget, Gerald, or decide not to come back, I think you'd better take this. I see. Well, I was expecting this. I don't dislike you as much as I did half an hour ago, Gerald. In fact, in some odd way, I rather respect you more than I've ever done before. At least you've been honest. But it's made a difference. You and I aren't the same people who sat down to dinner here. We'd have to start all over again, getting to know each other. Sheila. I'm not defending Gerald, but you must understand that a lot but of don't young men... Don't interfere, please, Father. Gerald knows what I mean, and you apparently don't. Yeah. I know what you mean. But I will come back, if I may. All right. Well, really, I don't know. I think we've just about come to an end of this wretched business. I don't think so. Excuse me. You know, you never showed him that photograph. No, it wasn't necessary. I thought it better not to. You have a photograph of this girl? Yes. I think you'd better look at it. Well, that's the only particular reason why I should. Oh, probably not, but I think you'd better look at it. Oh, very well. You recognize her? No. Why should I? Well, she might have changed a bit since then, but... Uh, can't think she should have changed all that much. I don't understand you, Inspector. You mean you don't choose to, Mrs. Burney? I meant what I said. Gerald must have come back. Unless it's your son just gone out. I'll see. Mrs. Burling, you're a member, and a prominent member, of the Bromley Women's Charity Organization, aren't you? Go on, Mother. You might as well admit it. Yes, she is. Why? It's an organization to which women in distress can appeal for help in various forms. Yes, it? we've done a great deal of very useful work in helping deserving cases. There was a meeting of the uh, interviewing committee two weeks ago. Yes, I dare say there was. You know very well there was, Mrs. Burling. You were in the chair. And if I was, what business is it of yours? You want me to tell you, in plain words? It must be Eric. Have you been up to his room? Oh, yes. I called out on both landings. It must have been Eric going out. Silly boy. But can he have gone to? Oh, I can't imagine. Of course, he's in one of his excitable moods. Well, it's not that we need him here, but it is worrying all the same. Yes, we do need him here. And if he's not back soon, I shall have to go and find him. He's probably just gone to cool off. He'll be back soon. I hope so. And why should you hope so? I'll tell you that, Mrs. Burling, when you've answered my questions. Is there any reason why my wife should answer any of your questions, Inspector? Yes, a very good reason. You remember that Mr. Croft told us, quite truthfully, I believe, that he hadn't spoken to or seen Eva Smith since last September. Hmm. Well, Mrs. Burling spoke to and saw her only two weeks ago. Mother! Is this true? Yes. Quite true. She applied to your committee for help, didn't she? Yes. Not as Eva Smith? No. Nor as Daisy Renton. As what, then? First, she called herself Mrs. Burling. Mrs. Burling? Oh, it was quite simply a piece of gross impertinence, quite deliberate. And naturally, it was one of the things that prejudiced me against her case. I should think so, too. Damned impudence. You admit to being prejudiced against her case? Yes, Mother, she's just died a horrible death. Don't forget. I am very sorry, but I think she had only herself to blame. Was it uh, owing to your influence, as the most prominent member of the committee, 
that help was refused to this girl? Possibly. Was it or was it not your influence? Yes, it was. I didn't like her manner. She'd impertinently made use of our name, though she pretended afterwards it just happened to be the first she thought of. She had to admit, after I began questioning her, that she had no claim to the name, that she wasn't married, and that the story she told at first about her husband who deserted her was quite false. It didn't take me long to get the truth, or some of the truth, out of her. Why did she want help? You know very well why she wanted help. No, I don't. I know why she needed help, but as I wasn't there, I don't know what she asked of your committee. I don't think we need discuss it. You have no hope of not discussing it, Mrs. Burley. If you think you can bring any pressure to bear upon me, Inspector, you're quite mistaken. The girl asked for assistance. I wasn't satisfied with her claim, so I used my influence to have it refused. I have done nothing wrong, and you know it. I think you've done something terribly wrong, and that you're going to spend the rest of your life regretting it. Just remember, this girl was going to have a child. Oh, no. Horrible. Horrible. How could she have wanted to kill herself? She'd been turned down and turned out too many times. This was the end. Mother, you must have known. It was because she was going to have a child that she asked for assistance from your mother's committee. Now, look here. This wasn't <laughs> Gerald Croft. No, no, nothing to do with him. Oh, thank goodness for that. Though I don't know why I should care now. And you've nothing else to tell me? Yes. I'll tell you what I told her. Go and look for the father of the child. It's his responsibility. That doesn't make it any the less yours. She came to you for help when no woman could have needed it more. And you not only refused it yourself, but you saw to it that the others refused it too. She not only needed money, but she needed advice, help, sympathy, understanding. Now, you've had children. You must have known what she was feeling, and you slammed the door in her face. Mother, I think it was cruel and vile. I must say, Sybil, when this comes out at the inquest, it isn't going to look too good for us. I, I mean, the press might easily oh, take stop it Stop it, both of you. In the circumstances, I think I was perfectly justified. The girl had begun by telling a pack of lies. Afterwards, when I got at the truth, I discovered she knew who the father was. She was quite certain about that. So I told her it was her business to make him responsible. And what did she reply to that? Oh, a lot of silly nonsense. Uh, what was it? Whatever it was, I know it made me finally lose all patience with her. She was giving herself ridiculous airs. She was claiming elaborate fine feelings that were simply absurd for a girl in her position. Her position now is that she lies with a burnt out inside on a slab. Oh, that's quite now, unnecessary. Now, don't stammer and yammer at me, man. I'm losing all patience with you people. What did she say? She said the father was only a youngster. There couldn't be any question of marrying him. It would be wrong for them both. He had given her money, but she wasn't going to take any more money from him. Why wasn't she going to take any more money? A lot of silly nonsense. I didn't believe a word of it. I warn you, you're making it worse for yourself. Now, what reason did she give for not wanting to take any more money? Her story was... He'd said something one night, he was drunk, of course, that gave her the idea that it wasn't his money. At least that's the story she finally told, after I refused to believe her original story and I didn't see any reason to believe that one story should be any truer than the other. But if her story was true, and that the boy was stealing money, then she came to you for help, to keep this youngster out of any more trouble, isn't that so? Possibly. But it sounded ridiculous to me, so I was perfectly justified in advising my committee not to allow her claim for assistance. And you're not sorry now when you know what happened to the girl? I am sorry she came to such a horrible end, but I accept no blame for it at all. Who is to blame, then? Well, first, the girl herself. For letting father and me have her chucked out of her job. Secondly, I blame the father of the child she was going to have. But if her story was true and he was stealing money... But there is no point in assuming that. But if we do, now what then? Well, then he'd be entirely responsible because the girl would never have come to us and have been refused assistance if it hadn't been for him. So he's the chief culprit anyhow? Certainly. And he ought to be dealt with very severely. Mother, stop! Be quiet, Sheila. But don't you see? Oh, you are behaving like a hysterical child tonight. And if you would take some steps to find this young man and see to it that he's compelled to confess in public his responsibility instead of staying here asking quite unnecessary questions, then you really would be doing your duty. Don't worry, Mrs. Burling. I shall do my duty. Oh, I am glad to hear it. And now perhaps you'd like to say good night. Not yet. 
I'm waiting. Waiting for what? To do my duty. Now, Mother, don't you see? But you... I mean... It's ridiculous. Inspector, are you trying to tell us that my boy is mixed up in all this? If he is, then we know what to do, don't we? Mrs. Burling's just told us. My God. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. Mother, I begged you and begged you to stop. You know, don't you? Yes, we know. Eric, I can't believe it. There must be some mistake. You don't know what we've been saying. It's a good job for him he doesn't, isn't it? Why? Because Mother's been busy blaming everything on the young man who got that girl into trouble. It's her opinion that he shouldn't escape. She wants it to be made an example of. That's enough, Sheila. You haven't made things any easier for me, have you, Mother? But I didn't know it was you. I never dreamt. Besides... You're not the type. You don't get drunk. Of course he does. I told you he did. You told well, her? Well, Eric, I had to. It was simply bound to come out, so I thought she might as well know in advance. Oh, Sheila, I simply don't understand your attitude. Neither do I. If you'd had any sense of loyalty... Oh, just a minute, Mr. Burling. There'll be plenty of time when I've gone for you all to adjust to family relationships. But now I must hear what your son has to tell us. Could I have a drink first? No. Yes. I know he's your son and this is your house, but look at him. He needs a drink now just to see him through. Oh, all right, go on. I'm beginning to understand a lot of things I didn't understand before. Well? When did you first meet this girl? One night last November. Where did you meet her? In the Palace Bar. I'd been there an hour or so with two or three chaps. I was a bit squiffy. What happened then? I began talking to her, stood her a few drinks. I was rather far gone by the time we had to go. Was she drunk too? But she told me afterwards she was, a bit, chiefly because she'd not had much to eat that day. Why had she gone there? Well, she wasn't the usual sort, but, well, I suppose she didn't know what to do. There was some woman who wanted her to go there. I never quite understood about that. And you went with her to her lodgings that night? Yes. I insisted, it seems. I'm not very clear about it, but... Afterwards, she told me she didn't want me to go in, but that, well... I was in that sort of state when a chap easily turns nasty, and... Uh, I threatened to make a row. And so she let you in. And that's when it happened. And I didn't even remember. That's the hellish thing. Oh, God. How stupid all this is. Oh, Eric, how could you? Sheila, take your mother along to the drawing room. But I want to stay. You heard what I said. Come on, Sybil. When did you meet her again? About a fortnight afterwards. By appointment? No. I couldn't remember her name or where she lived. I happened to meet her again in the Palace Bar. More drinks? Yes. Though that time I wasn't so bad. And then you took her home again? Yes. And this time we talked a bit. She told me something about herself. And I talked too. I told her my name and uh, what I did. And you made love again? Yes. I wasn't in love with her or anything, but I liked her. Well, she was pretty and a good sport. And you had to go to bed with her. Well, I'm old enough to be married, aren't I? Uh, did you make arrangements to meet her again? Yes. And the next time, or the time after, she told me she thought she was going to have a baby. She wasn't sure. 
And then she was. And of course, she was very worried about it. Oh, yes. And so was I. I was in a hell of a state about it. Did she suggest that you ought to marry her? No. She didn't want me to marry her. Said I didn't love her. All that. In a way, she treated me as if I were a kid, though I was nearly as old as she was. Well, what did you propose to do about it? Well, she hadn't a job. and didn't feel like trying again for one. And she hadn't any money, so... I insisted on giving her enough money to keep her going. Until she refused to take any more. How much did you give her altogether? I suppose about 50 pounds, all told. 50 pounds? Where did you get 50 pounds from? That's my question, too. I uh, got it from the office. My office? Yes. You mean you stole the money? Not really. What do you mean, not really? Oh, Arthur, I'm sorry. I couldn't stay in there. I simply had to know what's happening. Oh, I can tell you what's happening. He's admitted he was responsible for the girl's condition. Now he's telling us that he's applied her with money stolen from my office. You stole money. Not really. I intended to pay it back. Oh, we've heard that story before. How could you have paid it back? I'd have managed somehow. I had to have some money. What I want to know is, how did you manage to take as much money as that out of my office without somebody knowing? There were some small accounts to collect, and I asked for cash. Ah, you gave the firm's receipt and kept the money? Yes. Ah, stupid young fool. Why didn't you come to me when you found yourself in this mess? Because you're not the kind of father a chap can go to when he's in trouble. That's why! Don't talk to me like that. Your trouble is you've been spoiled. And my trouble is I haven't much time. You'll be able to divide the responsibility between you when I've gone. Just one last question, that's all. The girl discovered that this money you were giving her was stolen, didn't she? Yes. That was the worst of all. She wouldn't take any more. And she didn't want to see me again. Yeah, but how did you know that? Did she tell you? No, she told me nothing. I never spoke to her. She told Mother. She? Well, he has to know. She told you? But did she come here? She couldn't have done. She didn't know I lived here. What happened? Come on, don't just look like that. Tell me. Tell me what happened. I'll tell you what happened. She applied to your mother's committee for help after she'd done with you. Your mother refused to help. Then you killed her. She came to you to protect me, and you turned her away. Yes, and you killed her. And the child she was going to have, my child, your own grandchild. You killed them both. Oh. Damn you. Damn you. Oh, Eric, please. I didn't know. I didn't understand. You don't understand anything. You never did. You never even tried. You... Eric, don't! Hysterical young fool, keep back or I'll oh, stop! Now be quiet a moment and listen to me. I don't need to know any more, neither do you. This girl killed herself and died a horrible death. But each one of you helped to kill her. Now just remember that. Don't ever forget it. But then I don't think you ever will. Inspector, I... I'd give... Thousands. Thousands. You're offering the money at the wrong time, Mr. Burling. No. I don't think you ever will forget. Nor that young man Croft, though he made her happy for a time. Well, Eva Smith's gone. You can't do her any more harm. You can't do her any good either. You can't even say, I'm sorry, Eva Smith. That's the worst of it. Just remember this. One Eva Smith's gone. But there are millions and millions and millions of Eva Smiths and John Smith still left with us with their lives, their hopes and fears, their sufferings, their chance of happiness, all intertwined with our lives and what we think 
and say and do. We don't live alone. We're all members of one body. We are responsible for each other. And I'll tell you this, that the time will soon come when if men will not learn that lesson, then they'll be taught it in blood and fire and anguish. Good night. You're the one I blame for all this. I'll bet I am. Yes, you don't know yet what all you've done. Most of this is bound to come out. It'll be a public scandal. Well, I don't care now. You? You don't care about anything much. But I care. I was almost certain of a knighthood on the next honours list. Oh. When I look back on tonight, when I think how I was feeling when the five of us sat down at this dinner table. Yes, and do you remember what you said to Gerald and me after dinner? You told us that a man has to look after himself, mind his own business, not take any notice of these cranks who tell us that everybody has to look after everybody else as though we were all mixed up together. Do you remember? Yes, and then one of those cranks walked in. The inspector. <laughs> I didn't notice you told him that it's every man for himself. Is that when the inspector came? Just after father had said that? Yes. What of it? Now what's the matter, Sheila? It's odd. It's very odd. It doesn't much matter now, of course, but... Was he really a police inspector? Well, if he wasn't, it matters a devil of a lot. In fact, it makes all the difference. No, it doesn't. Oh, don't talk nonsense. Of course it does. Well, it doesn't to me. If everything that's come out tonight is true, then it doesn't much matter who it was who made us confess it. But if it's any comfort to you, and it isn't to me, I have an idea, and I had it all along, vaguely, that there was something curious about him. He never seemed like an ordinary police inspector. Oh, that's right. I felt that, too. Didn't you? I must say, his manner was quite extraordinary. So... so rude and offensive. Yes, and the way he talked. They don't talk like that. I've had dealings with dozens of them. We hardly ever told him anything he didn't already know. Did you notice that? That's nothing. He had a bit of information left by the girl, and he made a few sharp guesses. But if we hadn't talked so much, he wouldn't have had a lot to go on. Now, who's this? It's Mr. Croft. I hope you don't mind my coming back. No, of course not, Gerald. Oh, well, I had a special reason for coming. When did that inspector go? Only a few minutes ago. It got worse after you left. How did he behave? If you ask me, he behaved in a most peculiar and suspicious manner. He was so rude to Mr. Burling and me, it was quite extraordinary. Hmm. What is it? Do you know something? That man wasn't a police officer. What? Are you certain? Well, I'm almost certain. I met a police sergeant I know down the road. I asked him about this Inspector Gould and described the chap clearly to him. He swore there wasn't any Inspector Gould or anybody like him on the force here. Uh, you didn't tell him any... Oh, no, 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 no. I passed it off by saying I'd been having an argument with somebody. But the point is, this sergeant was dead certain that there wasn't any Inspector at all like the chap who came here. By Jingo! A fake. We've been had. I'm going to make certain of this. What are you going to do? Well, bring up the Chief Constable, Colonel Roberts. Well, careful what you say, dear. Oh, of course. I was going to ring him anyway. I've had my suspicions all along. Eight, seven.
Oh, uh, Colonel Roberts, please. Mr. Arthur Burling here. Oh, Roberts. Uh, Arthur Burling here. I I'm sorry to bother you this late at night. Um, but uh, have you taken an Inspector Gould onto your staff lately? Gould. G-O-O-L-E. Oh, he's about five foot ten. Uh, high forehead. But very quiet voice. Oh, I see. Well, that settles it. Uh, no, no, it was just a little argument we were having here. Uh, good night. There is no Inspector Ghoul on the police. That man definitely was not a police officer. As Gerald says, we've been had. I've felt it all the time. He never talked like one. He never even looked like one. Oh, this makes a difference, you know. In fact, it makes all the difference. Oh, of course. I suppose we're all nice people now. Oh, if you've nothing more sensible to say, Sheila, you'd better keep quiet. She's right, though. And you keep quiet, too. If that man had been a police inspector and Arthur, he had you Arthur. confess... Arthur, careful. Oh, yes. You see, Gerald, you happen to know the rest of our crimes and idiocies. Well, that's all right. I... I don't want to. What do you make of this business now? Was it a hoax? Oh, of course. Somebody put that fellow up to coming up here and hoaxing us. Well, there are people in this town who dislike me enough to do that. We should have seen through him in the first place. I wish I'd been here when he first arrived. I'd have asked him a few questions before I allowed him to ask us any. It's all right saying that now. I was the only one of you who didn't give in to him. And now I say we must discuss this business quietly and sensibly and decide if there's anything to be done about it. You're absolutely right, my dear. Now, we found out one important fact. The fellow was not a police inspector and he's hoaxed us. But that may not be the end of it by any means. No, I'm sure it isn't. You are, eh? Good. Oh, sit down, Eric. I'm all right. All right? You're anything but all right. Well, I don't stand there as if you... As, as if, if what? Well, as if you've got nothing to do with the rest of us. You'd better remember your position, young man. If anybody's up to his neck in it, you are, so you'd better take some interest in it. Oh, I do take an interest in it. I take too much. That's my trouble. It's mine, too. Now, just you listen, you two. If you're still feeling on edge, the least you can do is keep quiet. Now... I admit that fellow's antics have rattled us all a bit, but we found him out. Now, all we've got to do is keep our heads. Now, it's our turn. Our turn to do what? To behave sensibly, Sheila, which is more than you've been doing. What's the use of talking about behaving sensibly? You're all pretending now that nothing's really happened at all. But the girl's still dead, isn't she? And it doesn't alter the fact that we all helped to kill her. But is it a fact? Of course it is. Between us, we drove that girl to commit suicide. Did we? Who says so? Because what I say is there's no more real evidence we did than that that chap who came here was a police inspector. Of course there is. But there isn't. But look at it. A man comes here pretending to be a police inspector. It's a, a hoax of some kind. Now, what does he do? Very artfully, by adding up bits of information he's picked up here and there, he bluffs us all into confessing that we've been mixed up in this girl's life in one way or another. And so we have. But how do we know it's the same girl? Oh, now, wait a minute. Let's see how that would work. Now. Ah, uh, no, it wouldn't. We all admitted it. Well, all right, you all admitted something to do with a girl, but how do we know it's the same girl? Look here, Mr. Burley. Now, you sack a girl called Eva Smith. Now, you've forgotten, but then he shows you a photograph of her. And then you remember, right? Well, that bit's straightforward enough, but what then? Well, then he happens to know that Sheila had a girl sack from Millwood's shop. He tells us that it's this same Eva Smith, and he shows her a photograph that she recognises. Yes, the same photograph. But how do we know it's the same photograph? 
Did you see the one he showed your father? No, I didn't. And did your father see the one he showed you? No, he didn't, and I see what you mean now. We have no real evidence it was the same photograph, and therefore no evidence it was the same girl. Why not take me? Oh, he didn't show me a photograph, remember? Caught me out by announcing that the girl had changed her name to Daisy Renton, and I gave myself away at once because I'd known her Daisy Renton. And we haven't the slightest proof that Daisy Renton was really Eva Smith. We've only his word for it. He could have been bluffing all the time. Of course he could. He probably was. Well, now, what happened after I left? Well, I was upset because Eric had left the house. And this man said that if Eric didn't come back, he'd have to go and find him. Well, that made me feel worse still. And then, quite suddenly, he said, I had seen Eva Smith only two weeks ago. Ah, those were his exact words. Like a fool, I said, yes, I had. Now, she didn't call herself Eva Smith when she came to see you at the committee, did she? No, of course not. But when he suddenly turned on me with all those questions, well, I answered more or less as he wanted me to. But, Mother, don't forget that he showed you a photograph of the girl before that, and you obviously recognised it. Well, did anybody else see the photograph? No. He showed it only to me. Well, then, don't you see? We've still no evidence it was the same girl. He could have shown you a photograph of any girl who applied to the committee. And how do we know she was Eva Smith or Daisy Renton? Gerald's dead bite! He could have been showing us a different photograph each time and we'd have been none the wiser. We can all have been recognising different girls. Exactly! Did he ask you to identify a photograph, Eric? No, he didn't need a photograph by the time he got round to me. But it must have been the same girl I knew that went round to see Mother. Ah, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, that meeting of your mother's could have been just as much a put-up job as all this police inspector business. He could have been bluffing all the time. How could he? The girl's dead, isn't she? What girl? There were probably four or five different girls. Well, that doesn't matter to me. The one that I knew is dead. Is she? How do we know she is? Oh, that's right. Now, you've hit it. How do we know any girl killed herself today? Oh, now, let's take a look at that one. Put yourself in that fella's place. First thing he has to do is give us a shock. So he does that right off. He says a girl's died in the infirmary after swallowing strong disinfectant. Oh, died in agony. It's all right. Well, don't pile it on. Ah, just hearing it again. That shakes you up a bit, doesn't it? That's what this fella had to do, shake us at once, and then started asking us questions until we didn't know where we were. Oh, let's admit it. He had the laugh of us all right. He could laugh his head off if I knew it really was all a hoax. Well, I'm convinced it is. No police inquiry. No one girl that all this happened to. No scandal. And no suicide? Well, we can settle that at once. How? By telephoning the infirmary. Either there's a dead girl there or there isn't. Ah, but it would look a bit odd, wouldn't it? I mean, ringing up at this time of night. I don't mind doing it. And if there isn't? Anyway, we'll see. Oh, Bromley 8986. Is that the infirmary? Oh, uh, this is Gerald Croft, Crofts Limited. Yeah. Well, we're rather concerned about one of our employees. Have you had a girl brought in today who committed suicide after drinking disinfectant? Or any like suicide? Yes, are we? Yes. And you're certain of that? Thank you very much. No girl has died in there today. Nobody's been brought in after drinking disinfectants. They haven't had a suicide in months. There you are. Proof positive. The whole story's just a lot of moonshine. Nothing but an elaborate cell. <sighs> Gerald, 
Have a drink. Oh, I could just do with one now. I must say, Gerald, you've handled the whole thing very cleverly. I'm most grateful to you. Well, I got outside and cooled off. I was able to work things out of me. Ah, but he didn't have you on the run like he did the rest of us. I must confess he had us a bit scared for once. But I have a particular reason for not wanting a public scandal at this moment. <laughs> well, here's to us. Ah, oh, come on, Sheila. Don't look like that. It's all over now. The worst part is that you're forgetting one thing I still can't forget. Everything we said had happened really had happened. And if it didn't end tragically, well, that's lucky for us, but it might have done. <laughs> but it's all different now. Oh, come, come. You can see that, can't you? You all helped to kill her. <laughs> and I wish you could have seen the look on your faces when he said that. <laughs> Going to bed, young woman? It frightens me the way you talk. Nonsense. You're pretending everything's just as it was before. I'm not. No, but the others are. Well, isn't it? We've been had, that's all. So, nothing's really happened. We can all go on behaving just as we did. Well, why shouldn't we? I tell you, whoever that inspector was, it was anything but a joke. You knew it then. You began to learn something. And now you've stopped. You're ready to go on in the same old way. And you're not, eh? No, because I remember what he said and how he looked and what he made me feel. Fire and blood and anguish. And it frightens me the way you talk and I can't listen to any more of it. And I agree with Sheila. Frightens me, too. Well, go to bed, then, and don't stand there being hysterical. They're overtired. In the morning, they'll be as amused as we are. It's all over, Sheila. Now, what about this? No, not yet. It's too soon. I need time to think. Oh, look at the pair of them. The famous younger generation. They know it all. They can't even take a joke. <laughs> yes, Mr. Burling speaking. That was the police. A girl has just died on her way to the infirmary after swallowing disinfectant. A police inspector is on his way here to ask some questions. 